good morning, everyone. Um, I'm trying to um, squeeze an awful lot into just 20 minutes this morning. Uh, I want to tell you about some work we're doing at UCL, and it's work we're doing on computable contracts, but in order to explain that, I have to show you the link from smart contracts to um, computable contracts. Um, what I'm going to do is to start off with some definitions and start with the problematic definition of the term smart contracts. And, uh, and then also have a look at terms such as smart legal contracts and smart contract code. Having done that, we'll then go on to what is most of uh, the talk this morning, which is how we evolve from smart contracts towards computable contracts. And I want to try and explain to you some of the problems that we have with smart contracts. Um, what are the problems that we're trying to solve? And then I'll move on to how will we get there? How will we solve this? How will we achieve the vision? And then finally, I'll finish off with some words about the payoff and uh, what will this enable. So I want to start with some words about the term smart contract. It's really problematic because if you talk to five different people, you'll get five different definitions of what a smart contract is. Now, in fact, it was Nick Sharbo back in the 1990s, uh, sometime around 1994, who first coined the term smart contract. And uh, he defined it as a computerized transaction protocol that uh, executes the terms of a contract. Well, that by itself is problematic because he didn't define what a protocol is. But it's quite clear that he was interested in automating legal contracts. Now, Nick wrote a number of... Um, a number of papers, and he gave lots and lots of different examples, and each example was slightly different, and it's quite possible to cherry-pick from uh, his different papers and say, well, that's what smart contracts are, whilst missing the breadth. So his in intention was that smart contracts would be very broad. If we skip forward to 2017, we can see that the state of Arizona has um, had a completely different definition so the state of Arizona has defined a smart contract, as you'll, you'll see up here, as being something that is a computer program, and it's entirely defined in terms of the code. So it's, a comp it's an event-driven computer program with state. It runs on a distributed ledger, etc., etc. Notice that there is no mention of legal contract there in that definition. So what's happened between... Nick Sharbo's initial idea and what's going on now with different very technical definitions of smart contracts is, of course, the rise of DLT, distributed ledger technology. And in particular, the choice of Ethereum to use the term smart contract for scripts running on, on their distributed ledger. And so that has, has shifted the definition a bit. And even now I'm finding every few months there's yet another definition of what a smart contract is. Now, economists and lawyers have been quite critical of this. And um, something you may hear quite often is the phrase, smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. And what they tend to mean by this is, first of all, as far as they can see, they're just little bits of computer code that aren't doing very much. They don't appear to be that smart. But more importantly, they don't have the things that would make them legal contracts. So they're not enforceable in a court of law. But, of course, some people would say, well, who cares? That's the whole point. We don't want to use lawyers. We don't want to use courts. But for the area that my team's been interested in for many years now, we really need these smart contracts to be enforceable in law. So we've been looking at the automation of smart derivatives contracts, looking at OTC derivatives. So here you'll have a, an agreement. It's a legal contract. It may last for 30 years. The notional amount could be some enormous amount of money. And you definitely want that to be legally enforceable in a court of law. So we found that it was impossible to make any progress with so many different definitions of the term smart contract. And eventually, we threw up our hands in, in horror and we said, well, we'll redefine. We'll, we'll make a portmanteau definition. And we came up with this um, after several months of talking to lawyers and computer scientists and trying to find what's the, the perfect collection of words that can capture all the things that we want to be covered by the, the term smart contract. 
We came up with this definition here about uh, a smart contract being an automatable and enforceable agreement, automated by computer, although some parts may require human input and control. That's really important for smart derivatives contracts because over 30 years, the law can change. You've got to be able to stop the, the code from running, modify it, and then let it continue. Enforceable either by legal enforcement of rights and obligations, so that's what we need for, um, for our smart derivatives contracts, or via tamper-proof execution of computer code. And, and that's the other way of getting enforcement that the computer scientists are, are quite interested in. We found this really useful within our project, looking at smart derivatives contracts, but it's clearly been very useful for a lot of people. It's been cited uh, a very large number of times, both in academia and in industry. If we think about other terms that we use, we use the terms smart legal contract and smart contract code, and these help us to differentiate be between different aspects um, that we may be talking about. So in this diagram here, I'm showing you on the left is kind of tr traditional contracting. So for a derivatives contract, there will be a legal contract written in possibly English, some natural language. And then parts of it are often automated, but they're automated with different code at the different counterparties. So each party would have their own code automating some small part of what's, what's going on. If we then move to what happens with, um, with smart contracts on distributed ledgers, we then start to talk about the smart legal contract because now we have something that is automatable and it's a legal contract, so it's legally enforceable. And then we would have our common code running on a distributed ledger uh, underneath, and that would be the smart contract code. So now having started with that kind of basis for what we mean and the terms that we use, what we mean by them, what I want to do is to show you our vision for where things are going into the future. So on this diagram, there are going to be three columns. We'll start on the left, and as we slowly populate this diagram going to the right, we'll be going towards increased computability. So in this left column, what we have is business as usual. So um, <clears throat> what we might call standard contracting. We've got the legal contract, which is written in natural language text. Let's say it's English. And then at the bottom, there's no common code, so we're not using a distributed ledger yet, um, but there is very often code written in, let, let's say these are um, OTC derivatives that are, um, part of, they are part of wholesale banking. And so we'll have perhaps Barclays Bank may, may have code that automates some parts of the OTC derivatives performance. The thing I want you to focus on is the link between the two. Because what we want to be able to do is to make sure that the code is faithful to the contract. Now, at the moment, business as usual, what happens is the validation of that code at the bottom happens through person-to-person -person con contact, people talking, lawyers talking to computer scientists, and through shared documentation. So here are the problems we see with this. First of all, looking at the bottom, looking at the, uh, the code. So without a distributed ledger, so this is kind of traditional coding, each party might be coding in a different language. They might have different interpretations of the legal contract. They might have different semantic errors, which are very difficult to, to find during test and debug. This leads to conflicts, exceptions, and the need for human resolution. And it makes the whole business very error-prone, very expensive. But if we look at the speech bubble above that, we can see there are lots of problems with the way that the code is validated. The link between the lawyers and the computer scientists is very unreliable. Firstly, because it's human to human, and that's always unreliable. Secondly, because there's a massive gap in understanding between lawyers and computer scientists. And we didn't appreciate how big that gap was until we were about six months into our project. And we suddenly started to realize that 
Here we have two deeply specialized disciplines, law and computer science, with deeply technical meanings attached to quite commonplace words. And we found that we were constantly talking at cross purposes. So that division between law and computer science is quite problematic. As a result, code validation is time consuming. And because of that, the scope of the underlying code is very limited. If we start to move towards embracing DLT, and we start to use some smart contracts, then we'll see that we can still have natural language text for our legal contract, but embedded in that text, there may be variables or values that could be transferred down to the code. So we've got another way of linking from the contract to the code, and that is going to help with some of the validation of the code. And um, this technique was something that um, we called smart contract templates. So now we've got common code at the bottom. We have lots of advantages of moving to DLT with common code. So many of the issues that we had at that bottom layer with the code are resolved by moving to DLT. But in terms of the validation of the code, there's only a tiny improvement. And because we've still got all those problems at the, layer, at the middle layer of trying to validate the code, then the code is still only going to be, uh, it will implement and, and automate quite small parts of the overall legal contract. And we would like to see a world where we can actually automate more of the legal contract. So this is where we're going with the vision of computable contracts. So the idea is that we'll have the legal contract written using standardized and structured natural language. So the lawyers will think they're using a language such as English, but in a, a very structured way. So they'll have a more constrained choice of words they'll use and a, a slightly constrained way of putting sentences together, but it will still look like English. And the idea is that this would be understandable both by humans and by computers. Once we've got that in place, then we can have automatic translation from contract to code. We can have automatic verification and automatic validation of the code. We'll also be able to do automatic analysis of the contract itself. I'll come back to that later. And then at the bottom, we'll have our common code running on our distributed ledgers. So this is the vision of where we're, we're headed. The question is, how on earth do we get there? And there are three things we're working on at the moment. The first is understanding the complex meaning of legal contracts. Now, fortunately, there's been decades of academic work on trying to understand legal contracts. So what we're doing at the moment is taking a lot of that academic work standing on the shoulders of giants, and then trying to make it more practical. So we're looking at specific contracts and saying, well, how does this apply to this specific contract? And we're trying to understand issues such as the rights and obligations of the parties. We're trying to understand the temporal aspects of the agreement. So time past, time present, time future, fixed points in time, floating points in time, conditional times, and also weird legal concepts such as deemed time. So even though an event happened at a particular time, legally you can deem it to have occurred at a different time, which was an interesting concept to us. So what we're doing is we're looking at all the different ways in which lawyers talk about time and then matching that to a lot of academic work on, uh, on temporal logic. And the, uh, the third of these bullet points is looking at the required actions, um, which may or may not be encodable. And we still don't expect that the whole of the legal contract would be turned into code. What we're aiming for is to be able to maximize the amount of code where we want to be able to encode parts of the contract. There's some parts you will never want to encode. So this is looking at Deontic semantics, temporal semantics, and operational semantics. Those are the three key areas we're looking at at the moment. 
following on from that is the design of a new domain-specific language. So this would be the language that looks like English, that the lawyers can use for drafting their contracts, but it's structured and standardized in such a way that it has formal syntax and semantics. So it's directly targeted at lawyers, and it's understandable by both humans and computers. So the formal syntax and semantics means that computers can understand it. And once we've got that in place, the final layer is writing the automated generation of code, the automatic verification and validation of the code, and the automat automated analytics for the contract itself. And the idea is that overall, this should be correct by construction from the point at which the lawyers start to construct new contracts, the code that emanates from that will automatically be correct. So the payoff, what does this enable? So the idea is that computable contracts will support automation of a much larger proportion of the legal contracts. And that might include things such as payments netting, closeout netting, arranging uh, and managing payments. So, for instance, managing late payments from one party. And managing things like, well, if, if a payment is late, then let's say this is a, uh, an OTC derivatives contract under the ISDA master agreement, well, then notification must be given to the party that's late. And then there must be a grace period, and then notification must be given again to say, and now it's the end of the grace period, etc. And even more importantly, if your counterparty is late paying you, then your code should be able to automatically suspend your payments going out because you're permitted to do that under the legal contract. So there are a lot of issues that at the moment may be difficult to automate that we're hoping to expand the code to automate. Um, the final thing, the final bullet point there is looking at potential events of default. The um, ISDA master agreement allows you not only to identify events of default, but potential events of default which may arise before your counterparty gets to the final awful state of defaulting, by which time it might be too late. And so we're looking at ways of automating the collection of data and information about the creditworthiness of your counterparties. So this will lead to streamlined contract performance, um, greater cost reduction, Lower risk, fewer disputes, more automated dispute resolution. We're hoping to empower lawyers with automated analytics, for instance, looking for conflicting provisions um, or missing provisions in a contract, and to provide an automated and, and direct link between the contract and the code. And the most important thing here, and, and the message that I want to leave you with, is the fact that this would ensure one crucial property, the one thing we're aiming to do, which is to ensure that the code is faithful to the contract. And that's it. And I think I just managed that in time. No, I think that's so fascinating. Let's uh, take some questions. Is there anything on Slido? Otherwise, uh, any questions from the floor? A couple of hands up down here if we can have some microphones. There's one here and here. We've got a microphone. I think, I think your hand was up first. Well, the question was, my question is also on Slido. You mentioned um, structured language. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wondered if um, this was extensible business reporting language that I've been hearing a lot about uh, as penetrating in banks, for example. Um, no, it's different to the extensible business reporting language. This is a drafting language for drafting legal contracts and providing lawyers with a way of still being very expressive in the way that they, um, they write down the various legal provisions, but forcing them to do it in a way where each word and the way that the words are combined one with the other has a formal meaning that a computer can understand as well as a, a human. Not yet. No, we're, we're not that far ahead. This is looking quite a long way ahead at the moment. So at the moment, we're at the stage of looking at the different uh, semantics, the temporal semantics, geontic and operational semantics. And we're starting to get some ideas about how to structure the, the domain-specific language. 
but we haven't finalized that yet. So there, there was, I, I think you had your hand up earlier, so. I think I have the mic now, so maybe I'll start. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. Um, what's your take on oracles? Because smart contracts can, um, as long as the information is stored in some sort of digital form, mm -hmm. smart contract can take the, inter, uh, the information from that. But what if the execution of smart contract depends on an event happening in real life? For example, a bank transfer. I know that PSD2 and open banking movement can facilitate that. But does the computable, uh, do the computable, uh, computable um, contracts have a solution for that? Okay, so this is an issue to do with the implementation of smart contracts, smart contract code, and how smart contract code gets information from the outside world, from outside of the distributed ledger. It's not something we need to think about for computable contracts, um, because once we get down to the low-level code, then we will be using exactly the same mechanisms as, as other smart contract code would use. And so th the problem here, um, in case anybody isn't aware of the problem, is that if you've got smart contract code running simultaneously on multiple nodes across a distributed ledger, you don't want all of them trying to get external information from different sources, or maybe from the same source, but at a very slightly different time, um, because then they might start calculating different things. So the way that you deal with that typically is to have something called an oracle, which will be a single point that retrieves the information from the outside world, and then makes it available to the smart contract code running on all the different nodes. So they all get to see the same information. Uh, Chris, can I ask you to maybe address some of the Slido questions and we'll take two mm. more from the floor. Okay, so the, uh, the first one we talked about. Um, Front-loaded work to develop the structured language seems eminently achievable. What's holding it up? Use case doubts or Luddite lawyers. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so um, there are a few lawyers who've expressed some concern, but once we have managed to talk to them and explain that we understand that, for instance, um, it's really important that a legal contract is able to express deliberate vagueness. Okay, so well, that's fine, and we would treat that as one of the areas that you wouldn't wish to encode. That's why I say I don't think we'll ever get to the stage where we want to encode everything, all, all parts of the, of the contract, but we need a way of being able to say um, this is meant to be vague. And once you know a sentence is meant to be vague, then you can skip over it when looking at the semantics of, of the contract. Or you can maybe say, well, let's say, what, what is the semantic content of it that we need to include in the rest of, of the contract? Once we start showing that we understand a lot of the issues, then the lawyers start to relax a bit more, and then they get interested. Because one of the things that lawyers really like is the craft of drafting. And I remember asking lots, uh, I was around a table with half a dozen lawyers, and I went around each one of them and I asked them, drafting, contract drafting, is it an art or a science? And they all said, it's an art. And they love this art of drafting, and so they actually get involved in this idea of how would you design a language that gives them all the flexibility, but also is understandable by computers. Great, let's uh, take two more from the floor and then we'll have to move on to the next speaker. Okay. So, so you, um, oh. ah, right, yeah. uh, you mentioned uh, earlier on in your presentation that there were some things that wouldn't be encodable and then you just mentioned uh, areas of deliberate vagueness. Yes. And much of contracts can be reduced to Boolean logic, um, but some of it can't. So if you're dealing, what are the kinds of terms that you think fall within things that would not be encodable, things that would be deliberately vague? Would these be reasonable duty of care or um, okay. acts of war? What, what, what types of things would these be? So there are some legal phrases that if, you've, if you're not a lawyer and you read them, they seem very vague. Some of them are intended to be vague and will always be vague, and the intention is that they will be interpreted by a court of law within the context of the facts of a particular thing going wrong. Other seemingly vague expressions actually have a, a, a tighter meaning within the context of the industry or within the context of the particular area of law that governs this contract, etc. Um, 
there are things, uh, there are aspects of implied terms, etc., that that we need to be mindful of, and somehow we need to include into our understanding of, of the contract. Um, other areas, typical areas where there's deliberate vagueness, is where the parties are trying to come to some agreement about something that is very unlikely to happen. And if it's very unlikely to happen, they may feel it's not worth paying the lawyers lots of money to spend the time to try and get something that's really precise. And they, they can be happy to leave that as deliberately vague, and then if ever it were to happen, it would be interpreted by the courts. Okay, thanks. Let's have the last question. Um, I was wondering if your team has done any work with, say, unexpected macro changes to the market. Uh, m uh, millions of derivative contracts reference interbank rates and LIBOR. Mm -hmm. And as some of us know, LIBOR is being replaced over the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. The replacement reference rate doesn't have yield curves built in and time codes built in. So it's not a case of just purely changing the reference point. It's an upheaval of a market. How does a smart contract or your team look at those sort of developments? Okay, so this is an excellent example of why we don't want tamper-proof code. So it's really important that if you've got a contract that's going to run for many, many years, within which, let's, so let's say we've got an interest rate swap that's going to last for 30 years, within that time, the law could change or some market infrastructure might change, something to do with um, market data might change. So you need to have the ability to pause the smart contract code, to make updates to it, and then to resume the code. Sometimes, all you need to do is to change the way that an oracle works. So you, you may not need to stop all of the smart contract code for all of the contracts. You may be able to do it in a simpler way just by changing an oracle so it retrieves the data from a different source. Does that answer the question? I think you'll have to take this offline. Thank you very okay. much. Right. Chris, that was marvellous and absolutely fascinating. And all the lawyers in the room, I'm sure, are really um, being thoughtful about their futures. So really appreciate you being with us. And let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much.